Okay, we better get going here. I didn't realize it was after 11, my apologies. So today uh, we're doing something entirely different. Uh, this is not from the book Better Living Through Economics. Uh, in fact, I don't think it would ever qualify to get in the book uh, in the sense that uh, there's going to be a lot of depressing stuff in this one uh, rather than uh, uplifting stuff. Uh, this one uh, is a, a, a chapter a colleague, Malcolm Getz, who's been at Vanderbilt for I guess one year less than I. Uh, he came the year after I did. Uh, and uh, in fact, I think I mentioned last time at one point there were four of us on the faculty here who had grown up near each other and were different ranks because of how we managed uh, uh, dealing with uh, the, uh, the Vietnam War and the draft. He was one of the four. Uh, he, was, he taught at Spelman College for a number of years uh, and grew up uh, pretty near me. I grew up on a potato farm. He grew up on a chicken farm. Uh, neither one of us likes to eat eggs and potatoes. Uh, there are, uh, we were uh, asked to write a chapter for a great big fat handbook uh, on uh, the evidence about the effects of intercollegiate athletics on two subjects, donations uh, and applications to the college. Uh, and we did so, and there is a 40-page essay with about 200 footnotes and all kinds of discussion of the technical aspects of the estimations in the articles we review. Uh, and at some point we realized no one is ever going to want to read that uh, other than the few scholars in this area. And so we wrote up the uh, shorter essay, a little without footnotes and so on, that I believe was distributed to you at the beginning of our sessions. Uh, and that was published in Change Magazine. And as I think I mentioned earlier, Change Magazine is a, a magazine for university presidents and provosts, and so you have to simplify the sentences and use single syllable <laughs> words. Uh, among other things, I'm of course being facetious, but uh, to not be facetious, you do have to take out all the boring details uh, and kind of make it snappy because uh, they don't want to spend a lot of time uh, reading it. So there's two versions of this for those of you who are really curious and have absolutely nothing else to do. Uh, there is the long version with all the footnotes. Uh, what I have done is expanded uh, this. I've given this talk at, uh, well, I gave it at Kentucky and Nebraska, two places that have intercollegiate athletics, uh, to say the least, uh, and uh, Montana State. And I put together a talk that, that is based on the article that Malcolm and I wrote, but also includes some stuff from a relatively recent book, two years old, I guess, by Charles Klotfelter, who is at Duke. Uh, probably the best book on intercollegiate athletics I have seen. Uh, it's not, he is an economist, but the book is not all about economics. It's about a lot of other things. So I've stolen some things from him because I did a very lengthy review of that book and I stole right out of my review. Uh, and then also a third source is a set of books co-authored by William Bowen, B-O-W-E-N, who was the president of Princeton for about 15 to 20 years and then became the president of the Mellon Foundation. And for the Mellon Foundation to attract him, uh, they had to promise that he would get a $20 million grant, which he used to collect data on 130,000 university graduates. Uh, his basic question was, does college athletics, participation in college athletics, uh, teach leadership skills that you could actually see later on in people's careers? So this big sample was taken from three classes, one of them in the 1950s, so that the people by, uh, uh, they did this in the very late 90s. Uh, by that point, we're nearing the end of their careers. One of them in the mid-1970s, uh, and then one of them in the late 1980s. So he had three snapshots of people as you move along, but all of them had moved well into their careers. The fraction of alumni of the 30 colleges and universities in that study, I do not remember the number, but I think it was over 50% that they contacted, uh, which trying to find 50% of the graduates of any college or university from the 1950s uh, would be uh, quite remarkable, but that's what you do when you have $20 million. Vanderbilt was in that study. Uh, the 30 
colleges include all eight Ivy League schools. Uh, it's eight or ten NESCAC schools. That's uh, academic jargon for elite private liberal arts colleges in the Northeast, like Amherst, Williams, uh, Wesleyan, and so on. And then there were eight other schools that actually have big-time sports programs, Notre Dame, Penn State, uh, what, who else was in there, North Carolina, Vanderbilt, if you want to say we have a big-time sports program, <laughs> uh, and uh, I can't remember any of the others. Uh, did I say Penn State was the, yeah, they were in there. There's, there's four others that are uh, about like those schools. So it's, it's quite a mixed study, uh, a, mi a mixed uh, composition. Oh, Michigan was one. Uh, the big publics and the ones that have uh, strong sports programs also are among the most elite academically of the big public universities. So you have you know, North Carolina, Michigan, uh, uh, and then a private uh, Notre Dame or Vanderbilt. So the whole study is, is pitched toward more academically elite, but I will try to draw some conclusions from it that maybe apply more broadly. So the question is, what does uh, big time college athletics do for colleges and universities? Well, first of all, it raises their medical insurance rates. <laughs> Look at the side of his neck. He looks like he's about to explode. I presume you know who this is. That's the coach of Kentucky. He's still there. I actually uh, uh, presented this talk at Kentucky. Uh, the coach was not there. Uh, he was out recruiting another basketball class because he had lost all of his in the first round of the draft for the NBA draft. He lost one of them last night. Uh, I wonder if he'll come back now. Uh, it's out for the year, his star for this year. Uh, it would be interesting to see if he uh, does come back for a second year. Uh, so it, it uh, may reduce the health of the employees of the university, but more seriously, uh, well, wh why do we have this relationship? Uh, that question's been around a long time. I started teaching a course on the economics of sports here at Vanderbilt in 1975. Uh, was not, the date is not an accident. In 1974, a book was published that had about 13 or 14 chapters uh, on different aspects of sports economics. And that, was the, that book was something to, the students could read, uh, along with a few articles that had been published on the subject, I suspect, at that time, I assigned the students to read about 80% of everything ever written in the area of the economics of sports. I'm still doing the course. I'm teaching it in the, the University of Adelaide in South Australia in a few months, uh, and uh, was working on the syllabus off and on over the last few weeks. I would suspect today uh, we assign about 1% uh, of the literature uh, in the area. It has just grown so much. Partly it's grown because once it gets started, people get interested in it. Another reason it has grown so much uh, is that uh, the significance, and particularly uh, read the word money, involved in big time college sports has ballooned since uh, the mid 1970s. Over that period, economists have uh, uh, tried to ask this question, uh, which people in other countries just find perplexing. Uh, why do American colleges and universities participate in big-time sports? We are the only country in the world uh, where you have, and, and the word big-time, I, 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 you should read that into that, commercialized. Uh, high revenue, in other words. Uh, uh, charging. My friends in Australia, when they come to visit here, can't imagine you actually have to pay to get in to see a football game. No, they expect to walk up and stand on the sidelines as they would they don't have American what they call gridiron football there uh, although uh, Australia is one of the few other countries in the world that call soccer soccer as it should be uh, because they have their own version of football the Australian rules uh, football but uh, at the college or the university level uh, college in Australia means a high school actually uh, but so at the university level uh, they just walk up and watch the events they do have what would be comparable to club sports in America, uh, in many, many other countries. Uh, uh, so one of the explanations that has come up, uh, that economists came up with, uh, for better or worse, kind of an academic one, is something called economies of scope. Economies of scope exist when you can produce 
two outputs with the same input. One of my favorite examples comes from an antitrust case I was involved in many years ago. Uh, if you are mining zinc, after you get the zinc out of the ground, you have to smash up the big rocks to get the zinc out of the rocks. And you're going to quickly learn that I didn't get very far in engineering at Rensselaer. Uh, but you, once you break it apart, uh, you discard the rocks because uh, you want the zinc. Well, uh, the rocks are all already mined and out of the ground, so you might as well produce rocks as well as zinc. Indeed, I was involved in an antitrust case where uh, other rock quarries were complaining that the zinc mine was undercutting them in the price of rocks because after the zinc mine was getting the zinc out, they had all these rocks and says, what do we do? And not only did they find somebody to haul the rocks away for free, they were even going to pay them. You know, and, and absent that, uh, they were going to have to haul the rocks away themselves and dispose of them uh, somewhere. Well, of course, if you have a rock quarry, and only a rock quarry, this would annoy you. Uh, and it did annoy them. But uh, from, a, from a, an efficiency, cost efficiency basis, uh, the economist would say, we need to get rid of the other rock quarries. Uh, if, if, in fact, we can produce all the rocks we want to as a byproduct of zinc, let's do it that way. It's a heck of a lot cheaper than having separate rock uh, quarries. Uh, so the economies of scope here would be uh, young, uh, healthy, uh, athletic individuals. Uh, we call them college or university students, and they might be able to do more than one thing at a time. I don't mean instantly at a time, but if there is diminishing marginal returns, a phrase uh, that you might have remembered from your introductory economics course uh, 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 way back in college, if there's diminishing marginal returns, well, all that means is you get tired of doing something if you keep doing it. Uh, and, uh, you know, studying for eight hours for an exam may not be much better than studying six hours, particularly when the last two required you to take, maybe in our day, coffee. Now they've got all kinds of other things. Uh, to stay awake, uh, that could even uh, harm your performance on the exam later on. Uh, if, if there is diminishing marginal returns rather than studying for 16 hours a day uh, while you're a university student. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, actually, there's evidence that students study about the same amount of time out of class as they're in class right now. They're in class 15 hours a week, and they study another 15 hours a week. That's 30 hours a week. And what are they going to do when they get a job? <laughs> uh, that, uh, that allegedly will take them uh, more than that, uh, and they think, uh, they think they're being put upon uh, right now. So uh, instead of studying more and more and more, maybe we could have them do some physical activity. And similarly, uh, you know, practicing blocking uh, for a running back uh, may also uh, have diminishing marginal returns, and 18 or 16 hours of that a day isn't worthwhile either, so split it up and have these young uh, people uh, uh, do uh, one, of the, one of these activities part of the day and the other another part of the day. Uh, Roger Knoll, the economist at Stanford, who edited that book back in 1974 that got this whole field going, uh, he's written several pieces uh, and has a different analysis of why we have big time sports in colleges. His, Analysis actually is much more about why we have sports in general, including intramural and club sports, and that is that there's a demand from students. Uh, and the demand from students today is much different than it was uh, five decades ago. Uh, I used to go on Sundays on my bicycle to a lot behind a school, and we would play softball every Sunday afternoon, and you'd just pick up sides. You remember tossing the bat one to the other, and you put your hands over the bat, and one that gets the last... Uh, uh, grab on the bat picks first, and you pick alternately, and uh, we wore jeans and t-shirts. Uh, today, uh, uh, my son, who was uh, uh, growing up during the 90s, uh, had, he has so many uniforms, uh, he played ice hockey, and uh, my wife, when we go to Predators games, uh, you know, everybody wears those $175 shirts uh, with, with a player's name on the back. Uh, we got ours for $15. Uh, they have Siegfried on the back. Uh, because they actually were our son's shirts, uh, and uh, he had a whole slew of them, and since the Predators provided the shirts most of the time, they looked like Predators shirts. And so every so often you'll hear somebody walking behind us saying, 
who's that? Did you, when did he play here? <laughs> yeah, right. Because a lot of the a lot of these shirts have people that uh, come and go. When you invest in one, uh, you want to make sure uh, uh, it's somebody with a long-term contract, <laughs> or else you'll be buying another hundred and seventy-five dollar shirt. So there may be a demand from students. Uh, uh, themselves, they like to participate in organized activities, they like wearing uniforms, they like to get trophies, uh, although uh, one wonders about that one year, I think my son probably played, he played ice hockey about a dozen years, I think he was about seven when he started, that, and that started out because we lived in Canada for a year, <laughs> and the other little kids there were making fun of them for not knowing what ice hockey was, so when we came back, my wife took him over to Centennial Park for skating lessons, and I guess needless to say, he has progressed a little faster than she has. She still goes around the edge uh, with her hand out. She doesn't actually touch the boards, uh, 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 but he's gotten a lot better uh, than that he, he, uh, over, over the years. Um, at one time, one year, uh, I think he had, was on a team that won about two games, and they handed out these little participation trophies at the end. He must have been 10 or something. He can't come home. He's holding the trophy down, saying, you know, Dad, too many trophies. <laughs> Meaning uh, he got the message that, why did you give me a trophy? We had an atrocious team this year. Uh, and if we ever do win the championship, then the trophy won't be worth much more than it was this year, uh, for heaven's sakes. But there is the allure of, of trophies and uniforms and the camaraderie of other players, so there may be a big demand from students, although that does not necessarily mean that you have to have the big-time commercialized sports. You could have a really uh, big-time intramural program uh, or club program such as MIT does. Uh, MIT actually probably has more people participating in athlete athletics uh, than most any college uh, in the country, and yet it does not participate in Division I sports uh, at, at any level. And they spend a lot of money on it as well. But they don't collect any gate receipts. However, I doubt either of those are the real explanations. Uh, number three here, the third bullet point, the round bullet point, is what I think most people think is the explanation. It raises money. Well, that's just downright false. And everybody involved in uh, big-time sports and in analyzing it know it is false. I have uh, some statistics there. About 80% of Americans think big-time sports makes money. You think it makes money at Vanderbilt? And yeah, then why does each student pay somewhere between two and three thousand dollars a year of their tuition that goes right to the athletic department? Yeah, uh, it's pretty high at Vanderbilt, and the reason it's pretty high, it's much more. We pay much more uh, uh, than Florida and Georgia and Tennessee do. And you're thinking, gosh, and we get weaker results uh, than the other places. That no, it has a lot to do with the student body size. Uh, the absolute dollars would be larger at the other schools. We have one of the smallest undergraduate student bodies uh, that participates in Division I sports. And so uh, even though our budget is much less than those other schools uh, for athletics, uh, the subsidy part of it uh, per student ends up being a lot more. Now, there is evidence that students like that and are willing to pay. How much they are willing to pay is a different question. The evidence that I'm going to point to as I go along is that participating in Division I sports does seem to attract more applicants. Interestingly, winning does not seem to matter. So Vanderbilt got it right. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm actually being serious. Uh, you want to participate at the highest level. It's the ability to go to the games. And I've, I've had season tickets in football for uh, 35 years. I've seen some of the greatest NFL players uh, 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 here. They were all wearing the other team's jerseys. Uh, but, I've, you know, it's been fun to go uh, to, to see uh, uh, the, the other team's uh, players uh, and some of ours, too. Uh, actually, we have, uh, at one point, we had, uh, about a year ago, six of our graduates were on the Chicago Bears, a friend of mine in Chicago. Uh, pointed that out to me and said, you know, this might mean the Bears have the best off-season reading list of any team in the National <laughs> Football League. Said, but I am not interested in their off-season reading list. And he's actually a university professor, but for the Bears, forget the academic stuff uh, uh, there. Uh, yes, sir? If it's not an economically viable sport, 
Why was the article in the newspaper last year saying that the athletic director at Vanderbilt was paid $2.6 million? Get to that. Get to that in just a minute. The next slide. Okay. So up there you can see some of the statistics. Uh, there's a guy at, uh, at Transylvania University who is uh, commissioned by the NCAA uh, to try to make sense of the various accounting systems at the 120 uh, Division I uh, football schools and try to make them comparable. This is quite a challenge. Uh, accounting systems, uh, quite legally, uh, are not always exactly the same. Uh, at one point, I don't know if this is true anymore, for example, about 20 years ago, uh, at Vanderbilt, uh, we, uh, the, we had one parent who paid the biggest tuition bill, that was the athletic director, who got a bill from the other units for the tuition of the players, whereas at Duke, a somewhat comparable institution, uh, the, the uh, 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 academic units were just told uh, the players will enroll and you just eat it, that's your problem. Uh, now, if you adjust for that, if you can, uh, can figure that out, all it is is a different unit paying for it at the different institutions. So back in those days, uh, we would look like we were having a bigger loss than Duke would. But Duke wasn't reporting all of their costs. They weren't reporting uh, the cost of the students, the tuition. Of course, neither place was reporting the cost of the physical facilities because universities don't have a capital account. When my wife, who just retired from Vanderbilt as an accountant, came to work here about 20 years ago, I remember the first night she comes home, she says, holy smokes. And I said, what? They don't have a capital account. There's no balance sheet. She had worked in the private sector before. Right? She worked for uh, Ingram Distribution. And she, you know, one of my jobs is to keep the balance sheet accurate. They don't have one. <laughs> and to begin with, she thought we were cheating. No, we aren't cheating. It's called fund accounting. It's a different kind of account accounting system. Uh, basically, we build a building or uh, another extension to the football stadium or whatever when we get some money for it. When one of you donates uh, $50 million, I'll fill the seats in at the, uh, what is it, north end of the stadium. Uh, and, but it doesn't go on the books or anything like that. So none of those costs are included. Well, if you compared it to businesses, uh, they all uh, 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 capitalize and depreciate their physical facilities, and that's one of the costs uh, that they have. So uh, while I was comparing Vanderbilt and Duke and how they differently, how they treated tuition differently, all the colleges and universities understate their costs because they don't put any of the physical facilities or, or, the, or the cost of the, of the land that those physical facilities sit on in, in their uh, books. So you can see very few football programs uh, make money. There was a famous book by James Duderstadt, who was the president of Michigan, that Michigan never made any money on, on football while he was the president. Michigan? What is it, 105,000 seats? So it didn't come close. Didn't come close. Two of the 14 schools in 2009-10, I do incidentally have 10-11 data, but uh, didn't add them, didn't want to change the slides. That's no difference. There's a few, few, dif few differences, uh, uh, minor differences in detail. Um, of those 14 football programs that do make money, uh, uh, excuse me, of the 22 um, uh, athletic departments that make money, two of them are Purdue and Indiana because it's a state law in Indiana uh, that the athletic programs of the universities cannot lose any money. Uh, and so whether they really do or whether they fudge the books uh, is, is uh, a different question. But, uh, so that doesn't leave very many other ones, and, and including a lot of Southeastern Conference schools. Uh, there, there's just not enough room uh, for the Big Ten, the Southeastern Conference, Notre Dame, USC, and so on. You add them all up and you think those all make money. No, there's not enough room for all of them. And uh, so how do they cover those costs? Well, you see on the very bottom, there, uh, what I was alluding to uh, at Vanderbilt, I don't know what our athletic budget is now. I was on the athletic committee about 20 years ago. Uh, uh, but it, I'm guessing today it's probably 35 to $40 million uh, a year. And very roughly, uh, a third of that will come from the SEC, uh, a, a third of that will come from student subsidies, and a third of that will come from ticket revenue and advertising. Actually, I think the student subsidy number is a little less than a third now. The SEC number is a little more uh, than a third now. Uh, uh, and this is not uh, unusual. 
the budgets of the top schools now are, are a little over 100 million. So we're a little under half of what a, what a Michigan or a USC or an Ohio State uh, would be spending. You see down at the bottom there, uh, USA Today went through uh, the records of lots and lots of schools. Uh, they didn't have them all. That's why they say over 800 million. They, they, they accounted for $800 million in student fees that were being used to subsidize athletic programs. Whether it's done directly, as we did, Joe Wyatt started that uh, at one point. He just said, I'm going to give the athletic department X dollars per year. Uh, uh, X was not fixed, so now it's X plus something. Uh, or whether it's done in the way that Duke was doing it 20 years ago, which is uh, we just won't uh, charge tuition to the athletic department. Can a student opt out paying that athletic fee? No. Go to an, you know, yes, uh, go to Washington University or Emory uh, uh, and, and so on. Uh, incidentally, before I go on, um, the book by Klotfelder starts out with a very interesting first section of the first chapter uh, discussing how uh, particularly faculty at most universities are always bemoaning the athletic department and whether we should be involved in uh, big time sports. Uh, and isn't this a terrible thing and we ought to drop out of big time sports? In the last 100 years, this is since about 1910, two universities have discontinued, two universities that in 1910 were ranked in the top 100 in football have stopped big time sports. Two. Do you know who they are? One of them's a very famous case. University of Chicago, Robert Hutchins, the president in the late 1930s, two years after Jay Berwanger, a Chicago student, won the first Heisman Trophy, uh, decided that they were no longer going to participate in big time uh, sports. Now they did go 0-9 or 0-10 or something like that that year, uh, but he made a famous speech uh, saying, well, uh, why should we be playing football? Maybe we should instead have uh, uh, horse racing stables and the students could clean out the stables and the small ones could be jockeys, uh, and so on. Uh, I, I'm just ridiculing the, uh, why this activity rather than some other, act, uh, other activity. And then there's one other. I'll bet, I'll bet there's probably a graduate from the other one in here. Well, SMU, <laughs> SMU stopped for, I think, two years. Uh, not voluntarily. I meant voluntarily. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, SMU, for those of you who don't, don't know where the laughter is coming from, uh, was actually given the death penalty. Uh, that must be 20, 25 years ago now. It seems to me like it was two years ago. After it was discovered that not only were the pay players being paid, but they were being paid by members of the Board of Trustees. Uh, and uh, so that, that was called lack of institutional control. I would say it wasn't. Uh, the, the institution had a lot of control, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, lack of institutional control of what they were supposed to uh, be, uh, be doing. The other one was Washington University in St. Louis. It discontinued big time sports uh, during World War II. So it was one right at the end of the 30s and then another one during World War II, and that's it. And there's been dozens and dozens uh, that have gone the other direction, have, have gone into big time uh, sports. Uh, one very famous case that kind of made the university, turned it from an obscure place that no one ever heard of, was Michigan State. Uh, and it was, a lot of people attribute the sports of putting Michigan State on the map and then it building up its academic reputation uh, uh, as a result of the attention uh, it got. So Klotfeller's point with pointing out that only two have left is that over a hundred years if you start with a hundred universities and you go for a hundred years, you probably have about 2,000 presidents of universities. They, if they last five years, uh, probably five, six, probably it was a little longer in the past, so maybe 1,800 or something like that. And only two times did the president see fit to drop big time sports. Maybe those of us who are criticizing don't understand everything about it. These, you know, we can always criticize a university president or chancellor and uh, their public figures and open to lots of pot shots, but in general, they're probably pretty smart people 
and they seem to be making decisions all in one direction stay in or get into big time commercialized sports so maybe before we start just chuckling about how stupid it is we being the faculty uh, we ought to think about it a little more carefully and try to figure out well why the heck do they want to stay in and that's what the rest of the slides are all about uh, indeed the main argument is that there are important indirect effects and here I've listed uh, uh, several of them. The first two were the ones that started this whole study, but uh, in Klotfeller's book, he talks about uh, uh, the importance of sports for uh, campus social capital. Indeed, uh, the, the whole idea of, uh, of, uh, uh, of faculty being able to talk to custodians about how the football team is doing, how the basketball team is doing, and bringing people together, uh, the emotional involvement uh, in it. Uh, he also has a, a, does a quite a history on uh, the effect of sports on racial integration, uh, particularly in southeastern conference schools. It was two very important events when Texas Western, that's now uh, UTEP, uh, El Paso, Texas El Paso, uh, all-black basketball team beat Kentucky in 65, uh, six. Six, 66. I, can, I, I know where I was sitting uh, watching the, uh, the TV uh, uh, after that Adolph Rupp says, uh, uh, enough of this, uh, you know, I'm going to uh, get some players like Texas Western had as well. And in football, it was uh, USC uh, humiliating Alabama uh, with two African-American running backs uh, running right through Alabama's defense and uh, Bryant saying the same thing, uh, that enough, uh, you know, and, and, and so the whole idea of the pressure to win apparently is more powerful <laughs> Uh, than the pressures to uh, maintain segregation. Uh, and after that happened, and this was in the, uh, uh, the basketball was in 1966. When I came here in 72, I think uh, Bill Ligon might have been the only African American on our team, but I believe it was the next year that Alabama, went, was coached by C.M. Newton, came to town uh, with uh, five black players and seven white players and when they were warming up, I said to my wife, hey, I can pick out the starters just by watching how they shoot layups. <laughs> and I did a very good job. <clears throat> At that point is, uh, if you're an African-American and you're going to be on my team, you better be contributing. It wasn't more than five or six years after that uh, that uh, there were four or five on every bench uh, as well. Uh, and, and we were, you know, past the whole thing. It, it, it was just... just uh, 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 dominated uh, because uh, coaches really want to win uh, and uh, and cutting out any group of possible players uh, is going to put you at a competitive disadvantage uh, and then uh, uh, there's also the idea a lot of people argue and I would argue too that uh, you know a lot of our ancestors left other countries coming here uh, and came here on the on the belief that it's uh, what you do that really matters, rather than whether you know the king or queen, uh, or uh, someone else uh, in, uh, or the the pope or a cardinal or somebody in a European country. Uh, and uh, indeed, athletics seems to be some one area where meritocracy really matters a whole lot. Uh, it's uh, there, there's actually evidence that there's a bunch of economists in a study of basketball coaches and whether they give playing time to the players who seem to produce the most per minute uh, on the court. And the answer to that is yes. Uh, and indeed, you would hope if they don't, uh, they're out of there. Indeed, probably the only major exception to that is uh, the, 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 the stories, uh, apocryphal or not, about if you're the coach's son. If you're the coach's son, a lot of people would argue, oh, he just plays because he's the coach's son. Most people who were coach's sons, and I'm not one of those, uh, would argue that, no, I had to be a lot better because everybody uh, thought that that's why I was going to play. And so I had a shine on the court and, uh, uh, so that they wouldn't start uh, saying that. Hmm. 
Well, uh, so maybe he already realized uh, that the, uh, uh, winning is going to drive this, uh, nothing else. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let me uh, t move on now. Why don't college sports make money like professional sports? Well, a lot of professional sports don't make a lot of money either. A lot of professional sports uh, 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 garner a lot of attention for the owners who can be the big shot in town uh, uh, and prance around, uh, you know, think Jerry Jones in Dallas, Bud Adams in Houston. That's where he lives, not here. <laughs> uh, uh, and so on. So, uh, and, and, and indeed, uh, what do professional sports generally do when they find they aren't making money? Think National Hockey League this year, 2004 or five. And another year back in the 90s, they lock them out. And they uh, try to change the uh, parameters of how much money the owners are going to get and how much money the players are going to get. So indeed, when they do uh, have financial difficulties, uh, they have some ways to try to uh, deal with that. One um, first thing on the list here is lack of internal controls. I don't really think this is uh, uh, all that important, although there is one big difference. Uh, since college players are not paid in order to preserve their virginity as amateurs, that's the story and we're sticking to it, okay? <laughs> since they aren't paid, the revenues that come into the unit, okay, don't have the players as claimants. In the professional leagues, most of them, uh, uh, well, all of them now, the, uh, the, the, f the four main uh, s men's uh, professional sports, the players get now, since the National Hockey League settled at 50%, somewhere between 50 and about two-thirds, 50% and two-thirds of the revenues go to the players. That leaves between a third and a half for other participants, coaches, general managers, owners, and so on. In the college uh, ranks, the players get very little. Uh, they may, the, the, the teams may, like at Vanderbilt, have to pay the tuition bill. Uh, but there is more left over for the others. And with more left over for the others, uh, the incentives uh, facing the others uh, to bid up their salaries uh, and perks and so on uh, probably are stronger than they are uh, in the professional leagues. Uh, I have mentioned uh, the peculiar fund accounting and the fact that we don't have depreciation costs for the facilities. Uh, there's also another funny thing that goes on that, that, that works in the uh, other direction. Sports may actually be a, a little less expensive than, than we think because not many of the institutions are like Vanderbilt with a fixed capacity of numbers of students. Whenever we admit another student, uh, somebody else has to go out the other end because there's, there's a cap, there's an enrollment cap that the Board of Trustees uh, has set. This was the basis for an argument I and some other faculty made in the 1970s, which eventually Provost Kiesler uh, bought into about 15 years after we were making the argument, that the plan they had for subsidizing the education of faculty dependents, read faculty uh, children, uh, which was uh, if you're I'm going to simplify it a little bit. It wasn't quite like this, but if your kid goes to Vanderbilt, uh, it's free. Uh, if your k kid goes elsewhere, I think we were paying 50% at the time. I'm not exactly uh, sure if I remember that accurately. Uh, but our argument uh, was uh, that uh, it, it, you know, it's not cheaper for the kid to go to Vanderbilt. That the argument was that, oh, they can come free because we'll just add them in on, in, into a class. No. If uh, my kid applies to Vanderbilt and gets in, they, that kid counts toward the enrollment cap. And your kid, if you're not a faculty member at Vanderbilt, doesn't get in. And the tuition you are going to pay, the full tuition you are going to pay, is money lost. And so they changed this in the early 1990s. And I thank the Lord. I have four children. I would not have asked any of them to come here. Uh, the reason is you shouldn't go to a college where your parents are teachers, particularly if they have a strange name. Uh, and your friends say, oh, did you know that person uh, in the economics department that gave me a grade that's keeping me out of medical school or something like that? Uh, that's just something you shouldn't ask an 18 or 19-year-old to uh, put up with. Uh, they changed it here so that, in fact, uh, uh, you, you, the kid could apply to go here or any other accredited college and they'd pay uh, up to Vanderbilt's tuition. Up to, and that's, uh, we're about 40th in the country. 
two of my four found some institutions that are in that 40 that have higher tuition, and then you have to pay all of the difference uh, above, uh, above the top. So there is a thought uh, in a lot of places, and, and this is, would be true a lot of big public universities, uh, where they are not uh, uh, at full capacity. Uh, so you just add the student uh, into classes, and they're going to have an empty dorm room anyway. It doesn't really cost that much, actually. But they put on the books the average cost of all students. And that will tend to exaggerate the costs of big-time sports, to the extent that that's true. On the other hand, uh, the athletes have tutoring and other facilities available to them that the typical student uh, does not. But the main reason, the main problem uh, with controlling costs is if you just spend a little bit more money, you can get a slightly better coach and if you have a slightly better coach, then you can win more games, and winning seems to attract a lot of fans. I'll bet I'm the only person this year that just canceled my football tickets after 35 years. Price went up too much. You did too? Price went up about 80% uh, for faculty, because we were getting a 50% discount now, to help us out because part of that was taxable. They reduced that to 20%. That's to help us out so that we don't have to report it on our income tax return. <laughs> Talk about uh, patronizing. Uh, I don't know who wrote that, but I have a, I have a hunch I do know who wrote that. Uh, it's just plain patronizing is what it was. Uh, but mostly, uh, except for the gentleman in the back and myself, mostly uh, people are more likely to go to games if the team is winning rather than less likely. Indeed, I also enjoyed very much uh, many Vanderbilt games my first 20 years where we would go two and nine or something like that. <laughs> but one of our wins was against one of those teams that can't stand to lose to us. You know, if you beat LSU or Florida or Georgia, uh, it is so much fun watching the other team's fans being so sad. <laughs> now, my wife tells me this is a character defect. Uh, <laughs> and that only people with Germanic surnames, Schadenfreude, I think it's called, uh, only people with German, there's apparently no English translation for that. Uh, taking great glee in other people's misery is the way I uh, uh, put it. Um, but, you know, when she comes into the room, she now knows when I'm watching a football game, she comes in and she says, oh, who are you? Oh, no, sorry, I was going to ask, who are you for? I know the answer to that. Who are you against uh, in this game? Yeah. So it, that's another thing. I, I found that to be really a lot of fun. Uh, I was at games where we, I was at one where we tied Georgia, and they were, I think, number one in the country way back in the 70s. Boy, were they distressed. <laughs> wow, were they. And the Vanderbilt fans were going crazy, and you look up the score, and, oh, it's a tie. Uh, and back when you could have ties. Uh, we don't have ties uh, anymore. So the, the real problem, though, is if you, if, suppose it's true, and I just refereed an academic paper uh, uh, just over the last week about the, the, uh, that uh, related coaches' salaries to winning. Uh, and there's pretty high correlation uh, uh, between, the, between them. So if paying a little bit more and getting Nick Saban to be your coach uh, or James Franklin to be your coach changes things around and you win uh, more games, Okay. There's a great temptation to do that because then you can raise the football ticket prices by 80% in one year. You know, and uh, that would bring in lots of revenue. And where does the revenue go? It's in the athletic department. Well, who could we pay with that? Well, let's see. We could pay the coach. We could pay the athletic director. That's about it. Uh -huh. Okay, so we got a lot more money to pay the athletic director. Oh, I mean the coach. Yeah. You know, uh, and it's a, just a small group of people there uh, that can get their hands on, uh, on those funds. Strikes me that for all the extra money we get, they ought to take that much out of the subsidy that's going from the students into the athletic department. But if you know anything about university politics, you won't be very sanguine about that happening. The problem with this argument, this makes sense, and indeed I, I recommended the, the journal publish that article, but I said you've got to have them add a section at the end about whether or not a university president uh, who is hiring one of the top coaches away from someone else. What, Arkansas hired the uh, Wisconsin coach, I think, and uh, gave him a $2 million a year raise. Uh, and so, you know, Arkansas is going to get back winning again, so watch out, James Franklin. Uh, uh, 
uh, the games won't be as easy as they were last year. I bet you Missouri and Auburn and Tennessee are also thinking they're not, not going to lose to Vanderbilt again. That's for damn sure. Uh, and they're hiring expensive coaches as well. Uh, everybody's thinking that, but every time a coach wins another game, somebody else loses another game. If you believe that winning is the output that is produced in sports, this is one, of, one strange industry. In aggregate, you cannot increase output. It's not like cars. It's not like medical services. If, and that's a big if, because there's actually evidence that wh while winning matters a whole lot, some other things matter as well. More people go to see Major League Baseball games than AAA Minor League Baseball games. And that's just because of the, the level of the talent that you're looking at. And a lot of people, I don't, but a lot of people like to go to All-Star games. I, I have no interest in All-Star games, but All-Star games, everybody has a um, higher talent level, so you might want to go and see that. There is, there's, there's more to it than just winning, but winning turns out to be quite important. And it's what economists call a zero-sum game. If I do better, you do worse. So now, while my high-priced coach wins more games, what happened to your team? Oh, you started losing. What do you have to do now? Hire the high-priced coach away from Wisconsin. Okay, so do you think all the rest of the teams in the league just look at Arkansas and say, oh, nuts, now we're going to lose more games in the future. Nothing we can do about it. No. No, whether there were three or four or five coaches' uh, openings in the SEC this year. Two of them, I think, came right after they lost to us. Kentucky uh, and, uh, and Auburn, right? Uh, came uh, uh, right after. We've also gotten, in the years past, the LSU coach got fired the week after they lost to us, and a Georgia coach got fired a week after they lost to us. Uh, uh, and, you know, it, it's one thing, as a, I, a friend of mine was president of Georgia, and he said one of the state legislatures were in his office uh, after they had lost for the only time to us in his 10 years, saying, you know, it's one thing to lose to Auburn, and it's another thing to lose to Florida, but you just lost to Van Der Bilt. He said the guy, <laughs> he had a period after each syllable, and he spit on his desk. Uh, he was so doggone mad about that. Uh, and the message was, and you're going to do something about it. You're not going to just sit there. And so while Auburn hires away a successful coach from Wisconsin, the other teams are also doing things that are spending money to try to get ahead. And in total, I can tell you right now how many wins, how many league wins there will be in the SEC in the football season coming up. I could tell you that today. Okay. Because, am I right, it's only pros that can still have a tie, right? And they're very rare. In college, I think you cannot have a tie. So I can tell you, I, all I have to do is count the games. And that's how many wins there will be. That's also how many losses there will be. Okay, uh, let me move on pretty quickly here. Uh, indirect effects, forms of advertising. This is from Charlie Klotfelder's article. I found this interesting. Uh, he had a research assistant look in the New York Times uh, one year, uh, and he had them look for stories about, uh, uh, what is it, 70, uh, 74 different universities, I guess it was. And notice um, the number of stories uh, uh, about schools that have big-time sports and don't, don't have big-time sports was about the same. It was about 10, 10 different stories uh, per uh, school. But look at the proportions about whether there's about sports or not about sports. Uh, really, they're actually flipped. Uh, the, 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 uh, in the non-sports schools, and we're talking, who are we talking about here? We're talking about Rochester and Carnegie Mellon and Chicago and MIT uh, and so Emory uh, and so on. Uh, they actually had more stories uh, uh, that were not about sports. Uh, but the really fun statistic is the bullet point right below the table. Among the 58 universities with big time sports, he also had the research assistant do internet, uh, uh, count the internet searches, uh, coach gets seven times as many as the president. Hmm. Attracts a lot of attention. Attracts a lot of attention uh, for better or worse. And if you watched our chancellor strutting around uh, 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 talking about how wonderful a football team is, uh, you can see another goal other than making money is uh, I'm a big shot. 
uh, now because I presided. Uh, I am successful. I have uh, done something no Vanderbilt president ever, or chancellor has ever done. Uh, so everybody look at me. Uh, I am successful. Everybody look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Uh, and so on. Uh, so let me turn now to uh, actually these, uh, uh, whether there's effects on donations and the, oh, well the biggest donor to a lot of schools is called the state government. Uh, there was a famous uh, 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 anecdote about uh, 1999, I think it was, yes, yes, uh, when Kentucky's men's team won the basketball championship and the women's team was in the final game and lost that year. That happened again, uh, two years ago, three years ago, something like that. Uh, and right after that, the University of Connecticut got an additional billion, not million, billion dollars from the state of Connecticut because we really like uh, our state university. Uh, Brad Humphreys, uh, an economist that does a lot of studies uh, uh, of sports economics, uh, decided that that was a little bit of too much of an anecdote to make much of, so he looked at 570 different universities uh, and uh, compared the ones that are in Division I, the Bowl Championship Series. I'm old, so I keep calling it Division I, but it's now called the Bowl Championship Series. These are the top 120 uh, programs. He compared those with the others uh, found, and tried to hold other things constant, the size of the institution, because a lot of schools get amounts per capita, per credits taken, uh, and the amount spent on research and trying to control for everything else found uh, that those with Division I football get 8% more from the state. And that's your biggest, if you're a state university, that's your biggest parent, if you will, paying tuition uh, because the amount of money, even today, as states have receded in their amount that they support uh, higher education are still uh, the, the largest single source uh, of, of, of funds. Some people have argued that uh, uh, big time sports attracts fans uh, and when all those people uh, uh, from Alabama come and park their RVs all around here for about a week before the game, do you ever wonder if they don't have jobs? <laughs> that puzzles me, because my guess is that Vanderbilt's not the only place they drive their dark red RV to and park for a week, and uh, at least the jobs I had, that would have occupied all of the vacation time. Uh, but in any case, uh, the argument has made you lots of sales tax. Actually, some economists have tried to look at this systematically. Uh, they did it uh, using uh, uh, the, uh, the state of Texas and uh, tried to look at sales tax revenue collections uh, in cities that were hosting uh, a, what used to be called the Big Eight, I guess, uh, Texas A&M, Texas Tech, Texas uh, Christian, uh, the University of Texas, and so on games. Uh, they actually found that sales revenue fell on game days. Uh, a lot of people I know uh, uh, leave town, leave town. Uh, uh, the American Economic Association has an office in Pittsburgh, and when the G, 20, I think, was meeting there, and not far away, uh, they actually closed their office and everybody just left Pittsburgh. And, and, and yet Pittsburgh was talking about how this was going to attract a whole lot of money to come in. So why, well, during the Olympics, so why don't the cities make any money? It appears that only Los Angeles has ever made money. There is a book by an economist on every single Olympics. Everybody I know that lives in Atlanta left Atlanta during the Atlanta Olympics, because you just don't want to be there. Uh, I come back from Australia. Uh, through Sydney, uh, just about the time uh, the Sydney Olympics uh, were held. That year I made sure I came back through Melbourne. Uh, I don't want to be there. Uh, the, the crowds, the you know, congestion, the difficulty of getting around. Now, it is true that while uh, most all the studies of Olympics find no economic effect, they find no economic effect during the Olympics. A lot of people who would maybe go to London as a tourist decided not to go to London as a tourist in the, during the London Olympics. I was there three weeks later. Hotel prices were normal. They were not what they were during the Olympics. And indeed, hotels were pretty full because I wasn't there actually as a tourist. I was there to, oh, I was there at a sports economics conference, actually, <laughs> uh, where the people who do the studies of the Olympics uh, 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 were giving papers. Uh, and they had some on the London Olympics. There's a displacement effect that moves around when the tourists might come. So if during the Olympics, only the people going to the Olympics come to town, it may look like you don't have any more revenue than if regular tourists had come to town. But the regular tourists actually come off season then at the other places. And that's very hard to figure out uh, who, who, who got displaced and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, you need to add that uh, in as well. 
So what are the uh, results? I uh, only got 15 minutes here um, and about three quarters of the slides. So let me try to summarize them. The effects on donations. There are lots of different studies. And the problem is there, there's almost never two the same. Uh, are we talking about donations just to athletics? Or are we talking about donations to the university that aren't to athletics? Are we talking about uh, donations from alumni? Are we talking about donations from non-alumni? Are we talking about how many donations you get or how much you get in donations? And you can see the list. I'm not going to go through all of them, other than I want to point out the second to the bottom one called panel data. Starting in the 1990s, uh, economists got their hands on four different data sets that report donations to colleges and universities. Okay, and you don't, it, it's irrelevant what they are, but they're all pretty good data sets, uh, but they're different uh, data sets. And for the first time, they got their hands on what we call panel data. Panel data are data for a large number of institutions, so you could look across the institutions and say, well, has UT gotten more donations over the years than Vanderbilt because they had typically have a better winning football program or something like that. And, here's the key thing, and they have the data for many years for each institution. So you can do the other kind of study that's often been done. You look at one institution and see what happens to donations when they win the national championship. Or, uh, uh, or a lot of people <laughs> also look at what happens when they go on probation for violating the rules and so on. And there have been a number of those studies. The study of Clemson won the national championship 25 years ago, I guess. Mississippi State, uh, uh, those studies have shown that they did very well in donations when uh, their teams did well. But then there's a study of Northwestern when they did very well. Remember that about 10, 12 years ago when everybody was screaming, well, if they can do it, why can't Vanderbilt do it? Uh, and it, it appears that their uh, donations went up. Their president actually says, though, claimed that, no, they didn't go up. Uh, we changed the accounting system. Uh, and uh, that's why it appears that the donations went up. So there's some on both sides of it. These panel data sets allow you to statistically uh, look at changes over time for individual institutions and at a point in time across institutions. And this is a very rich data set that allows you to average a lot of things going on. It helps you to draw a generalization. The panel data sets uh, in particular Uh, the panel data sets in particular uh, generally find that participating in Division I sports, big time sports, does seem to lead to modest increases in donations and winning in football, particularly winning the whole thing, going to a bowl game in football or getting into the basketball tournament. Basket uh, that's wrong. Basketball, basketball doesn't seem to have any effect uh, uh, on the donations. Uh, once or twice out of 20 or 25 studies, but mostly football, going to a bowl game seems to have an effect. But these effects are modest at best. And indeed, well, I'll get to your question in a second, uh, and indeed the point that uh, Mal Getz and I uh, make in this article is it is not sufficient, I want to get to the, here we go, it is not sufficient to simply look at whether donations go up when you have big time sports or when the sports win, you have to ask the further question, did they go enough up enough to cover the costs of doing that? And these studies never do that. All they do is they say, and particularly if you read the newspaper, it'll say, I think recently, I, I saw them in the last few days, uh, Tennessee's uh, contributions to its athletic department, they didn't have that in there, but it turns out it's to its athletic department, or down a quarter, I guess, after a bunch of uh, unsuccessful uh, uh, football seasons. Well, true, uh, they're down a quarter. Uh, what we really don't know are, are, are two things. Uh, how does that compare to the costs? Maybe the costs are down too, uh, for heaven's sakes, although they're not, because they're paying about four coaches at the same time now with their long-term contracts. Uh, it makes you, makes you think that, that the person who uh, signed the contract ought to be contributing uh, something to buying out the contract, doesn't it? Uh, in the same way that I always argued that if you, 
if a faculty make a bad tenure decision and you want to buy out somebody so they'd leave, the faculty who made the bad tenure decision should have to contribute to buying out the faculty member. How'd you like to be trying to get tenure in a system like that? <laughs> yeah, it's, that would be uh, horrific, uh, actually. So the, the, the point that we're making, Mal and I make, is you need to look at what we call the opportunity cost. You need to look at whether the amount of money spent on the big time sports program that maybe did raise some extra donations could have in fact raised even more donations if you took it and gave it to the development office. Ask them if they think they could ra uh, raise a lot of money. Okay, well, they'll all say yes, but you don't know for sure uh, about that. Secondly, if the donations, uh, if, if I start donating to uh, my alma mater because uh, I got my PhD at Wisconsin, so they've had a successful football, so I'm going to give more money to them, well, where would that money have gone otherwise? Probably to Vanderbilt. But Wisconsin's a better institution, right? <laughs> or Penn State, uh-oh, mm. whoops. So my point simply is, you can't decide uh, whether donating more to one thing is a good thing unless you know what the alternative is. Where would the funds have gone alternatively? Maybe they would have gone to the Heart Association or the Diabetes Foundation or something like that. You just don't know. Now we do, we are able to deduce that the individuals who made the donations thought that they were most valuable where they sent them. Because we do believe in consumer sovereignty and respect individuals' decisions. But we don't know how much better. So, you know, here I am struggling. Gee, this year, do I want to give money to Wisconsin or Penn State? Can't quite, uh, I think Wisconsin just has it. Just has it. So I give more money to Wisconsin, but the value of that fund, those funds that I would have given to Penn State is almost as good, high, almost as much. Yet the way it gets reported in the newspaper is you take the entire aggregate donated to Wisconsin and, whoa, Siegfried's donating lots of money to Wisconsin, and this is, this is a measure of how good that is forgets the next best alternative. Or really, what it's happening both here and with the second question, which is the student application, you are failing to look at the other side of the ledger. You're looking only at the benefits. I'd like to have a Mercedes. So I'll buy a Mercedes. Oh, did it really cost that much? Who would have thought? You know, I, di I didn't pay any attention to what it cost. I thought it cost the same as my old Mercury. $18,000. Oh, it's more? What a surprise! You know, that's the kind of analysis you're getting in the newspapers. And I see you have a question, but I only have a few minutes left. I better go on, because I want to talk about the, the, the admissions, uh, if I can. Let me move. Oops, I goofed. I pushed the wrong thing. And now I've stalled it. What have I done here? Uh, I got a whole series of these dumb things up here. Uh, what about applications and enrollments? This is actually worse. This is actually worse. There have been some decent studies uh, of this. The best one is uh, on the next slide. Toma and Cross. Uh, they looked at 16 NCAA football champions, uh, talked to the schools, asked the schools which are the five schools they compete with most for students. Uh, that'd be overlap, overlap schools where uh, uh, students often get into both schools and choose one of the two. Uh, and they did the same thing for uh, the basketball championships. And what they did was they looked at what happened to the applications to these other, your competing schools for students, the years after you won the championship, and then they looked at the school's uh, record. And you can see for 10 of the 16 NCAA championships, uh, applications went up, as I recall, like 2 3% per year. Uh, for a year. Uh, it can be a lot. Uh, if you have uh, 8,000 applications, uh, uh, you know, 2% times 8 is what? Uh, what is that? 160? Uh, yeah. Uh, applications. Uh, basketball, again, doesn't seem to have much of, uh, of an effect. In fact, if you look at the, most of these studies, they don't find much of an effect at all. And winning big does tend to give you a result uh, of a couple of percentage points. Now up at the top there, I have the North Carolina State effect after Jim Valvano won the championship and Doug Flutie's passed and when he won the Heisman Trophy, they had outrageously high effects. Uh, but here's the catch. 
these things, uh, these, these effects disappear within three years. Why do they disappear within three years? Because another team in your league just won the championship and took the applications away from you is why they uh, disappear. Okay. Moreover, the best couple of studies actually find that it is true that applications seem to go up when you're successful, but the academic credentials of the freshman class go down. How can that be? If you would get the same applications you would have gotten otherwise, plus you get a few more, can't the admissions people pick out the good ones out of the few more? Well, it appears that actually there's more going on there, that some of your top applicants say to themselves, oh, this is a football factory, I don't want to go there, and pull their applications uh, away. Uh, and and uh, the, one of the best recent studies by Pope and Pope, I guess it's on the next slide, uh, actually separated these uh, uh, and uh, indeed finds that students with low SATs are much more sensitive to sports winning uh, than students with high SATs. The students with high SATs are somewhat sensitive in the opposite direction of the students with the low uh, SATs. But now, once again, I want you to ask the question, let's suppose that success at sports, that having big time sports and success at sports lures more applications. How many of you, whom probably mo most of you, had children and grandchildren applying to college? How, do you, how would you feel about, uh, they want to go to Kentucky, didn't they win the NCAA basketball champion last year? That's a good reason to go to Kentucky, isn't it? I mean, they got into MIT, Stanford, and Kentucky, and surely you want them to go to Kentucky, right? Well, if if this is influencing the decisions about where people go to school, apply to and go to school, is this a better allocation of the students among the colleges and universities than would have occurred absent it? There is no evidence whatsoever that college and university sports increases the total number of people going to college. It probably does a little bit because some of the athletes themselves would not have had the financial wherewithal to attend any school. Uh, but we're talking uh, uh, 0 0.001 of the total or something like that. But there's no, what happens is it may rearrange the students among the colleges. So is it better that uh, a few more, even if it is the academically more gifted ones, go to the schools that win, go to, who won the uh, football? Alabama won again, didn't they? Uh, uh, go to Alabama and Kentucky instead of MIT and Stanford. Is that better? Well, I'm exaggerating to make the point. I see our Alabama graduate that has a firm opinion on that. <laughs> uh, but of any schools, and I'm, I, you, know, you don't need to compare schools uh, with, with high academic credentials to schools uh, with less high academic credentials. You can compare, uh, you know, is it better that one goes to Alabama than Auburn? And I don't know how they compare. Uh, now, I know everybody in the state of Alabama has an opinion on that. Uh, but... Is, is that really, is, does that help fit students into the place that fits them the best? I don't know. I'm skeptical. Uh, but that's what would have to happen for this to be a, quote, good thing. Let me, oh, out of time. There's one, one more really interesting thing I should report to you. Uh, uh, you can go, uh, oh, I didn't give her these slides. Uh, let me send these slides uh, uh, to Norma, and then you can can look at them uh, uh, at your leisure because there's a whole bunch more on some other things. But one thing I do want to report to you that comes out of the Bowen and Shulman books, and that is uh, that even at the Ivy League and elite, uh, uh, academically elite institutions, uh, athletes, back when the SAT uh, program was on a, on a 1600 was the maximum scores, uh, athletes at almost every school have about an average of roughly 200 point uh, deficit to the rest of the student body. Uh, that doesn't mean uh, that they can't graduate or benefit from, uh, from that. Uh, Vanderbilt has long had a policy, which uh, uh, a lot of other schools do, uh, of admitting athletes uh, that could not get in on their own, but never to admit athletes, remember the Ron Mercer case, basketball player with best friend on our team, never to admit somebody that won't predict that they're going to graduate. So we ran his numbers through every equation we have, trying to get to predict the 
grade point average to graduate, which you need to graduate. What that means is you have a 50% chance to graduate, actually, is what that means. We couldn't do it. So we went to Kentucky and won a national championship uh, as, what, a freshman or a sophomore. He only played two years there. Uh, seemed like he was a nice young man, but I guess he got arrested for having a loaded gun where you're not supposed to since then or something like that. Uh, athletes have come in with a disadvantage. Then what Bowen and Shulman find is once they get there, think Ivy League schools, because that's a big chunk of their study, they underperform the expectations you would have based on their disadvantage when they come in. Underperform. They do even worse than you would think somebody with a 200 point disadvantage uh, does. Interestingly, if they stop playing, and over half of the Ivy League players stop playing, so the Ivy League coaches have to recruit twice as many football players. Half of them leave. After their, during their freshman year, I don't want to play football anymore. Ha, huh, I got into Princeton. <laughs> That's the way to get into an Ivy League school. Uh, and then, then they quit. So to have enough players to field the team, they have a bigger job than the coaches at Michigan and Alabama. They have to recruit twice as many, which is a reason Swarthmore dropped football, because with a school with only 700 men, uh, they were having to recruit close to 100 of the 700 to play football. Okay, because they were all coming to Swarthmore and then they were quitting. Uh, so, and, but they were in the school and you had them. When they quit, it turns out their academic performance does not get any better. This was one of the really interesting aspects of the Bowen and Schulman books. On the other hand, if you go back to the 50s and even in the 70s, there were still walk-on players. Everybody know what a walk-on is? Non-scholarship player? Okay. And the walk-on players, uh, their performance was better than the recruited athletes, and it didn't go down when they started playing sports. In other words, the argument that it's the time that it takes doesn't seem to hold at all. Uh, if you give the recruited athletes more time, they don't do any better academically. If you give the walk-ons, just a regular student, less time because they're playing, they don't do any worse. It appears, and Bowen and Shulman kind of try to figure out what's going on, it appears to be more of a, a, a culture of recruited athletes that, 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 that my friends won't like me even if I, if I pretend like I've, or if, if it appears that I even have any interest in academics, and that this, this, is, this re recruits a, a, an attitude that is not a function of whether you're actually playing uh, or not, in contrast to the other people. Now, so the athletes do really awful but they graduate at a higher rate than the non-athletes. Whoa. Yes, they do. Isn't that our goal? Isn't that our goal? And I've helped a lot of uh, basketball players uh, tutor them individually to get through Econ 101. Uh, what, what's the coach interested in? He got to get a C. He got to get a C. He has to get a C. Oh, but if he spends more time with me, maybe he can get a B. No. Uh, he's got to get a C and then I want him at practice. Okay. So yes, they have a higher graduation rate. A lot of them graduate with a, here you need a 2.0, you know what I mean, a C average. You know, you got a lot of them with 2.01. Uh, they stayed eligible. That's what, that's, the, well think of the goals of the athletic department. The coach's job depends on winning. So he needs to keep the players eligible, as C.M. Newton once said to me, I've got to keep my players eligible. I can't recruit anybody who's good enough to play as a freshman, unlike Kentucky. Uh, so I need them when they're seniors. <laughs> so that's the only way uh, I can, can uh, compete. And then here, to really floor you, in these studies that Bowen and Shulman did, when they looked at the people who graduated in the 50s and the 70s, how are they doing 20, 30 years later? The athletes are making a lot more money. What? They come in with a deficit in SAT scores. They underperform in class even from that deficit. They graduate at a higher rate and they make a lot more money. What is going on? Well, uh, Bowen and Shulman look into this. They, the, the Ivy League athletes in particular go into an area called uh, FIRE, finance, insurance, and real estate in wildly disproportion to other students that graduate from the Ivy League schools. What are, what's fire, finance, insurance, and real estate, particularly for a young person? It's a cold call sales uh, uh, broker. You know, they're, they're salesmen, and, and to a large degree, they trade off their 
fame or notoriety or whatever you want to call it, of being an athlete. Uh, uh, so often, and they become car salesmen. And so wouldn't you like to go buy a car from Brett Favre? I would, yeah. Wow, Brett probably will know me then. Yeah. And so a lot of these jobs are relatively high risk, uh, but they actually have an advantage in, some, in sales jobs because people know who they are and they're based on personal relationships. Uh, and uh, they can attract uh, uh, customers or clients uh, that way. How do the huge yeah. uh, pro salaries figure into that? Uh, very few college players go on to play professionally. Uh, it, it, it's hard to tell the college players this, or it's hard to get them to believe that, uh, you know, but of, of the total uh, number. And uh, I don't remember, well, certainly from NESCAC and the Ivy League, there aren't many. So in this whole sample, even if they didn't pull them out, uh, they wouldn't have affected the ones in the 50s. Uh, uh, they still had to have an off-season job those days, uh, uh, so it wouldn't have affected that uh, very much. But my friend, uh, who's the chair of the Communication Studies Department, still reports the average sal starting salary of their graduates the year that Will Purdue graduated from the department. He uses the mean. I need to stop. Yeah. Thank you so very much. Thank you.